Good to see you again. Welcome to the road to recovery, the road to freedom with Mark. This is my half hourly slot every Friday where I bring to you one of my stories from um, around the world, my adventures around New Zealand and today is a very special one. I'm here today on my own for, for the first time in many, many months and my so-called friends have let me down and, you know, those sort of things break your heart. Like the old poem says, uh, he woke the morrow morn a sadder and a wiser man. That is the human condition and things happen, things change, people let you down. The important thing is <clears throat> to get up, to dust yourself off and to move on, to move forward. Never stop moving forward with your life. Be assured, great days will come and special things will happen. You know, I've come with an, a whisker, a whisker of losing my life five times. Today is one of those stories. <sighs> miracles, miracles do happen. <sighs> Once, maybe, but when it happens that many times, I can't help but think to know that uh, there is such a thing as destiny, that I have a destiny, that uh, all these things that happened were meant to happen. Now, I don't know exactly where the road goes, but uh, I have a funny feeling something special will happen in my life and uh, I look forward to it I, I relish it it will be something special alright well we've got a long song today the record of Edmund Fitzgerald very appropriate for um, this story so we'll get on with today's story this is the eye of the storm I had two and a half thousand dollars burning a hole in my pocket and found an old launch selling for that. It was in a poor state and I had visions of restoring it. So I headed down to Picton to take it for a spin before parting with my cash. All seemed in working order and the guy selling it had a broken leg. I shelled out the asking price, organised a berth for it in Wellington and cancelled the one in Picton. I made plans to motor it down Queen Charlotte Sounds, along Tory Channel, and anchor there for the night. Then at first light, cross Cook Strait into Wellington Harbour. A bold but doable plan, with two calm days in a row. As soon as I returned home, I fell ill with terrible headaches, sinus and jaw pain. I had no idea of the cause, but it had me bedridden for a good six months. All of the good weather passed by, and the launch sat on its mooring, slowly deteriorating. Eventually it started taking on water, and the Coast Guard were called to pump it out. I was forced to have it taken under tow to a shipwright's to have it fixed. Had I the wisdom to send it to the tip, then the story would have been short and sweet. But I was determined to get it seaworthy and make the dangerous trip across Cook Strait. The launch was taken in and out of the water a number of times, had the bilge pump replaced and a grand's worth of mechanical work done on it. All of this chewing up time and money whilst I was at home sick. Eventually I developed an abscess on my jaw which swelled up to the size of an orange. It burst and after three days I rang an ambulance to take me to hospital. At the hospital they told me I needed an operation urgently and had to drive to a hospital 250 kilometres north. By the time I got there I had bad blood poisoning so they put me on an antibiotic drip and filled me full of morphine. The pain was unbearable. 
Like malaria, my body would boil, then freeze, and the morphine made me puke. Within 24 hours, the antibiotics had done the trick, though more than once I had begged for death. A surgeon gave me a local anaesthetic that didn't work and operated on me in the raw. After more waves of pain, he finally wrenched a molar and drained the abscess. I recovered at home, and it was soon spring. The boat builder rang to say the launch was ready to sail, so I headed down to Picton. I took a rod and reel, tackle, clothes, tools, my dog Diamond, and as much cash as I could spare. The ferry crossing was uneventful and boded well for the return journey. When I got to the boat builders, I shelled out another $500 cash and was assured all was in working order. The main steering wheel was not connected up, so I would have to steer from the rear tiller, and I noticed the V-belt to the alternator looked rather slack, but was assured a mechanic had looked at it all over, and all was well. I was excited, but worried and nervous at the same time. The weather forecast was good, but crossing the Cook Strait in a 10 metre launch is a long and dangerous undertaking at any time. Everyone back home warned me against it, with what if scenarios that only made me more determined to do it. I had owned a small boat and worked crew on a commercial trawler, so I had a healthy respect for the sea. The launch itself was quite capable of the job, being fitted out with a Fordson diesel tractor engine with a cruising speed of six knots, slow but capable of running all day at that speed. She was 10 metres long but had a narrow 3 to 4 metre beam. Shaped like a large canoe, it was a double-ended caravel style which made it rock badly but overall its lines were very nice. Despite its loud tractor engine and rockiness, it was a nice ride and very responsive to its steering. She felt almost alive to the touch, guiding me which way to steer her. Having a double plant cowrie timber hull meant she moved with the water. Being at least 100 years old and handmade, a lot of care and attention to detail had been put into making her. Steering her from the tiller arm meant more direct contact with the rudder, which enhanced both the ride and the steering. It was a feeling of true freedom to have the motor humming along in the protection of Queen Charlotte Sounds. These boats in earlier times were called Sounds Specials or Sardine Specials, purpose-built for plying these waters. I decided to strike out. Buoyed by the fact it had just been repaired and the responsive feel of the craft, I headed up Queen Charlotte Sounds past the many quaint and beautiful bays, their shy batches peeping out from native bush and pine trees. A few hours run like this had my blood pumping as I turned northeast into Tory Channel in the final stretch of the first leg. I anchored three bays back from the entrance of the channel and made up a feed for myself and the dog. I drifted easily off to sleep, hoping to be home the following day. At dawn I woke, but noticed the tide running hard, so delayed leaving the entrance for a couple of hours. Around 8am I struck out, but it made little difference. A spring tide was running, and the mouth at the entrance was white, with a two metre confused chop for about a kilometre out. As soon as I hit the chop, the boat began to knife into the confused sea. With no safe direction to steer, I tried to hammer through it. The rough sea rattled everything so badly that the engine threw the loose V-belt. Then the engine cut out. I was at the mercy of this angry mess 
and the engine would not restart. Within a half an hour later, I decided to raise an SOS to the Coast Guard back in Picton. The vessel was a naiad with two huge outboards and would have me under tow within a few hours. I felt sick to the pit of my stomach, knowing that I would be dragged back past the cute batches like a hall of shame all the way to Picton. They had trouble finding me, so I let off flares and gave them my coordinates. A rope was lashed to the bow, and I was hauled at about four knots back down Tory Channel and Queen Charlotte Sounds to Picton. Waiting for me were the police and the harbour master and a small band of onlookers. The police were not too bothered, but the harbour master banned me from leaving port until it could be repaired. He was horrified by the look of the launch, but calmed down a little when I told him it had just spent three months at the boat builders. So I was stuck in Picton until I could find a mechanic. I was gutted things had gone so badly, especially since it was the dodgy V-belt that failed. For the first time in years, I decided to go drown my sorrows at the pub, leaving the dog on board to guard the boat. I wandered uptown to Mike's bar, which had a nice garden bar where I could smoke, a dining area for some well-priced pub meals and a lounge of pokey machines. I had a few pints and wasted some money on the pokies until I hit the jackpot of over $900. My financial problems sorted for the week I had a stake and struck up a friendship with the extended family that owned and ran the premises. I headed back in better spirits, fed and walked the dog, then slept very soundly, exhausted by the day's events. The next day I walked the dog early, found a good bakery and headed down to the mechanic who had charged me $1,000 for checking the motor over. When I got there, he wanted nothing to do with me and laughed when I asked him to come and take a look at the motor. Too busy, was all he told me, and it was quickly apparent I would get no joy. I knew the boat builder would be no better. I tried to get the launch shipped down, but could not get it unloaded in Wellington. My first day stuck in Picton came to a grinding halt, so I headed back to Mike's bar for some good company, beers and a steak. Another couple of hundred at the pokies lifted my spirits, so my stay turned out to be reasonably pleasant. The next day I tracked down another mechanic over in Waikawa Bay, who could come over in a few days for a look. So I settled into a routine of walking the dog in the morning, then the bakery, and later in the day off down the pub. A few pleasant days passed by till the mechanics called. Two of them turned up and were insistent that the motor had not been touched. I had been ripped off and the V-belt was over 90% worn out. They replaced it for a paltry $18.66 and started the motor up again. One guy ran me through the right start-up procedure and how to bleed air from the system. A simple bit fix and a bit of reassurance and I was happy again. The weather had not been the best, but a window of opportunity was coming up, so I headed back to Mike's bar for my final night and said my goodbyes and headed back to my boat. Right, we'll take a little bit of a break there and um, I'll play you something special. The Wreck of the Edmund Fitzgerald. The legend lives on from the Chippewa on down Of the big lake they call Gitchagumi 
the lake it is said never gives up her dead when the skies of November turn gloomy with a load of iron ore 26,000 tons more than the Edmund Fitzgerald weighed empty that good ship and true was a bone to be chewed when the gales of November came early the ship was the pride of the American side Coming back from some mill in Wisconsin As the big freighters go, it was bigger than most With a crew and good captain well seasoned Concluding some terms with a couple of steel firms When they left fully loaded for Cleveland Then later that night when the ship's bell rang could it be the north wind they've been feeling? The wind and the wires made a tattletale sound And the wave broke over the railing And every man knew as the captain did too Twas the witch of November come stealing The dawn came late and the breakfast had to wait When the gales of November came slashing When afternoon came it was freezing rain In the face of a hurricane west wind Saying, fellas, it's too rough to feed you At 7 p.m. a main hatchway gave in He said, fellas, it's been good to know you The captain wired in, he had water coming in And the good ship and crew was in peril And later that night when his lights went out of sight Came the wreck of the Edmund Fitzgerald Does anyone know where the love of God goes When the waves turn the minutes to hours The searchers all say they'd have made Whitefish Bay If they'd put 15 more miles behind her They might have split up or they might have capsized They may have broke deep and took water and all that remains is the faces and the names Of the wives and the sons and the daughters Lake Huron Roll Superior Sings in the rooms of her ice water mansion Oh, Michigan steams like a young man's dreams The islands and bays are for sportsmen And farther below Lake Ontario Takes in what Lake Erie can send her and The iron boats go as the mariners all know With the gales of November remember Welcome back. We had to cut that a little short. Time's marching on and we've got to get moving, so I'll get on with the story. The Eye of the Storm. The next morning I headed off. This time, however, I changed the plan for the route home. 
This time I would head all the way to the end of Queen Charlotte Sound and anchor for the night at Endeavour Inlet where I knew a couple. I had an uneventful run of some six hours with winds picking up to 20 knots. That night I walked around to Furno Lodge, enjoyed a good feed and a few beers. I caught up with some fishermen from Wellington who were staying over. They told me I, I would have to head off early as a front was coming in the afternoon. I packed it in early and slept a little fitfully, worried about the next day's crossing. I woke to a cloudy morning and motored out of Endeavour Inlet in Queen Charlotte Sound at a steady four knots, taking about four hours. It was eerily calm as I cleared the sounds and rounded the corner into Cook Strait. I opened up the motor to six knots as a large gentle swell pushed across my bow. The wind rose slowly, increasing about five knots every hour. By the time I passed the Brothers Rocks it was fifteen knots with a slow two metre swell and I noticed my fishing friends tucked in close to the rocks. Within ten minutes I noticed a large swell breaking over the top of Karori Rocks on the other side of the straits. Within another five minutes I was smack into a spring storm. The wind of 30 to 40 knots was opposed to the tide which made the sea rise up in huge confused peaks of wave. The panic rose in my throat as I suddenly realised the sea was too big for the launch. At first I tried to pick a course headlong into the waves but they began to curl and break. I came slamming down their backs as the swell lifted to five metres. The wind now howled over the waves, sweeping the tops back in a foul, hissing mess. I was forced to turn about and try to run with the swell, but the waves were huge and sucked the launch backwards up the face and into the barrel of the breaker. I gave it full throttle in a vain attempt to run with this now enormous swell. It was far too rough to do anything but hold on for grim life. I couldn't even get an SOS off. No ships were visible. I knew rescue was impossible. I was alone. Suddenly I was sucked backwards up an enormous swell. For a few agonising seconds I rode the top of this monster like a surfer disappearing back inside the barrel. Then we shot out and into space, the launch dropped away under me and I was launched into mid-air, the tiller arm in one hand as I flailed helplessly. Whilst in mid-air I had enough time to say, Oh, I'm an effing dead man, before plummeting straight down to the place I had just left. The launch landed with an explosion like a hand grenade inside the cabin. The fuel tank was blown off and thrown across the cabin. I landed in a heap and was almost knocked out. The dog came staggering out of the wreckage and collapsed on deck, seemingly dead. I felt a sudden wave of anger cut through my fear. With trembling hands I reattached the tiller arm. Almost instinctively I knew we needed power back if I was to have any hope of survival. I had to abandon the steering and reattach the fuel tank, leaving the boat at the mercy of the sea. I was thrown all over the place, bruising head, knees and elbows, but somehow managed to reattach the tank. In my head I could hear my old skipper giving me orders on what to do next. I furiously bled the fuel lines, gave it some engine start and turned the key. Slowly the engine coughed back into life and I hammered it into full throttle. I stumbled back to the stern and the tiller arm and headed up the face of an enormous wave. This time I turned and headed down the face, staying within centimetres of the breaking top. I braced my feet against the side and my chest and arms locked, against, locked the tiller arm in place. We came hurtling down the first wave like an express train at a good 30 knots. The sea hissed behind me like a thousand angry stakes. It screamed and I was too petrified to look back. The launch shuddered under the strain and I knew another mistake would be my last. It felt like an eternity locked in place as we flew along the face of this enormous wave. Eventually we slid back 
and was sucked backwards with the motor going full power forwards. Again I locked into place and the swell powered us forward at an incredible speed. It held us up on the face for as long as I did before allowing us to be sucked backwards again. The strain on the boat and me were beyond our design but somehow I managed to fight for my life. It was in that moment I realised just how desperately I wanted to live. For three hours I was stretched to breaking point as I battled to survive. Somehow I managed to ride out the worst of the angry storm like this, till finally I could change tack for the mouth of the harbour entrance. The swell now became more regular and I was able to race along the wave tops through the harbour entrance. I had taken on loads of water and the bilge pump worked overtime to drain the boat as I roared along at full throttle. I was shaking like a leaf through pain and exhaustion, but I knew at that point I had survived and the boat was still in one piece, if only just. I flew along past Bearing Head, up the channel of the harbour entrance to Port Nicholson and backed off the throttle as I rounded the corner at Hellswall Point. The sun was shining and the wind dropped to 15 knots with little evidence of the storm I had just survived. I took stock of the situation as I slowly motored towards the berth at Evans Bay and noticed I was taking on board, taking water on board through the damaged hull. By the time I reached the berth it became apparent the hull was badly damaged so I tied up at the mooring and stayed with the boat. After an hour it was obvious the bilge pump could not keep up with the incoming water and I was slowly sinking. I managed to restart the engine and motor round to the main ramp where we could lift the boat out of the water and place it on a cradle on the heart. On closer inspection it became apparent the hull was split and would need some major repairs. I couldn't keep the boat where it was and had to organise a truck to transport it over the hill to Mana Cruising Club in Porirua. All of my funds were quickly sucked up, paying for all of this, and I could not foot the bill for the major repairs required. So after a fair bit of procrastinating, I had to face the prospect of giving up on my dream and give the boat up to anyone prepared to take on the major overhaul required. The body healed fast enough from the beating I took out in the strait, but I was crushed at having to let go of the boat that had saved my life. I had managed to save both myself and the boat, but only just. After a few months I found a guy prepared to take on the job of repairing the boat, so gave it away for a song. I only managed to take the launch on a single journey, but it was one I will never forget. The end. Like the song says, does anyone know where the love of God goes when the minutes turn into hours? She was a mighty close thing. Well, that's me for another day. I've got to go. My time's up. I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you very much. And um, we'll catch you again next week. Bye for now.